but I'm telling you 75 to 95 percent of the time it comes out flattened. So uh, my name is Dave Flayton. Uh, I'm pleased to be here this morning. And um, uh, I, I just, uh, because I, I don't know a number uh, of people in the audience here, I've, I've, I've seen you during the conference, I've tried to touch base, but uh, let, me, let me give you just a little bit of background uh, on me. Uh, 32 years ago, uh, I entered the medical device industry with Abbott Diagnostics, was with Abbott for 13 years, and then went to a small startup called Ventana Medical Systems with revenues of about 12 uh, million U.S. dollars at the time. They're a, 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 a tissue cancer diagnostics company, um, and then uh, about um, 13, 12 years after that, uh, with, with revenues at about uh, $275 million annually. They were purchased by Roche uh, for companion diagnostic purposes uh, for, uh, for $3.4 billion. And so I've now been with uh, Terumo BCT for two years. And um, I started in blood, I went to tissue, and now I'm with, within, the, you know, in between those two spots uh, in, in cells. Uh, uh, live cells. So um, it, this is this is an exciting time, uh, and I'm going to go into a little bit of detail as to um, how that all fits with uh, Terumo BCT. So I have four categories uh, up here that I'm going to discuss in the next 20 minutes, but um, there really are th three take-home messages uh, that I, that I have for you today, and one is that for any device manufacturing company, or perhaps I could say any company, uh, you must have a long-term commitment to regenerative medicine. And you, you, will, you will see throughout this presentation why that's important. Uh, the second thing uh, I want to, the second message is that innovation is always a game changer. No matter what, uh, as we innovate, it will change the game and life will look different in two to three to five years than it does today. And the third thing is that automation will drive the cost of goods down. And throughout my presentation, hopefully you will see um, where that path leads to. So with that, let me uh, break into the presentation and give you just a little bit of background on Terumo uh, BCT. And uh, really all you need to know about Terumo is it's uh, uh, been a very successful company made up of three divisions. Blood centers, if you give blood, that machine sitting next to you, spinning it down and separating all the components is likely to be a, a Terumo BCT system. And then there's hospital uh, therapeutics. And then there's my group, the cell processing, which is the startup within uh, the company. And it's looked at that way. So uh, Terumo itself began as COBE back in 1964. So the company has been around, US-based, 4,800 employees uh, based in Colorado. We have a, very much of a worldwide uh, footprint. And uh, we're a global leader, as I've already mentioned, in the blood center and a hospital apheresis uh, space. Uh, approximately four years ago, um, prior to that, we, we were Caridian BCT. Uh, purchased by uh, uh, a Japanese company, um, uh, Terumo Corporation, uh, about four years ago. So now combined, it's about a $6 billion uh, entity. But we, uh, we operate very independent uh, in, uh, in Lakewood, uh, Colorado. Uh, so this, this is our mission, and uh, I think the important word up here for, for the sake of this uh, conversation is uh, innovation and, and quality. So let me go specifically to um, our uh, product lines. Um, as I said, we're the startup within Terumo, and we look at, the, at these three work cells, collections as a work cell, and we have, uh, if you're familiar with the Spectra Optia system, apheresis, uh, we also have a sterile connecting device, the SCD2B. And there's uh, the washing concentration isolation, uh, which is Elutra and the 2991, and then the, the, the culture culturing system where I'm going to spend uh, most of the time this morning speaking to uh, quantum. Uh, and then all along the way, we, we utilize a sterile connecting device to keep the, the system closed. So let me talk a little bit about the, the, the quantum system and then go into some detail on, on, the, on the facts and data around quantum. 
So it's a uh, no, uh, novel hollow fiber system, uh, closed continuous perfusion um, uh, system, and uh, if you look inside, you see a bioreactor. On the, on the lower right, uh, it's comprised of about 11,500 uh, fibers, and uh, it has a, a nice surface area of uh, 2.1 square meters, about the equivalent of a 40 stack. So the expansion system itself, uh, to, to Rumo, this is where you begin to see kind of the expertise of uh, the company coming into play in terms of the design of this system. Uh, because we're very good at blood bags, very good at tubing, very good at sterile, uh, working in sterile environments. And uh, here you see what that uh, unit looks like when it starts to come together. And then when it's put on board the system, this is, this is what it looks like. Um, the quantum is right outside the doors here, and you always just see that front section, but if you open it up, this is, this is what it looks like. So what, what does it do? I mean, what is it capable of? Um, you know, until about um, one year ago, it was focused, really, we were just focused in the cell therapy uh, area. Uh, typical MSCs, fibroblasts, um, a type of, uh, uh, you know, cell expansion for adherent cell types uh, only. Uh, however, we've had some very nice success in the last 12 months in the immunotherapy and the gene therapy space. At this week's uh, ASGCT meeting in Washington, D.C., um, there is a paper that is uh, being presented by uh, Dr. Gerhard Bauer uh, about uh, lentiviral vector applications, uh, and he did, he did all of his work uh, on the quantum where he saw a thousand-fold increase in over, uh, over manual methods. And uh, so that's, that's been a nice uh, way for us to expand the potential footprint uh, and the capabilities of the system. So, um, so this is a slide that um, I think we're all getting very familiar with, uh, including the valley of death uh, that, that, that's in, in between your phase one uh, and two and three. Um, but I think um, what this layers on top of that is kind of, you know, thinking that goes into that throughout that continuum, what becomes most important when. And uh, this is where it gets complex for all of us. Uh, at the beginning, uh, you know, not so concerned about regulatory. This is traditional. This isn't how it should be, but this is traditionally how it's gone. Uh, scalability is not so, con uh, so concerning. Um, uh, cost of goods at the beginning doesn't really matter. It needs to be flexible and operator skill uh, is high uh, at that point. But as you, get, as you move to the right and through the through this, um, approvals of, of the product uh, towards therapeutic delivery and commercial production, you, you can see how that world begins to change. And, and that is kind of the essence uh, of our challenge uh, because we, you know, there are, as a device company that, that is interested in, you know, long-term survival of all the cell therapy companies uh, and, and what they're doing out there, um, we might have a solution that isn't so, doesn't look so good today or isn't so important to them today, but it will become more important as time goes on. So that's something we're very aware of and at, uh, at all times trying to communicate uh, in a way that, um, maybe perhaps makes the company feel uh, better about taking a risk earlier on uh, to, so that they can gain the benefit later. So <clears throat> we've, um, you know, we, we today deal with lots of cell therapy companies, universities, hospital, uh, research uh, companies, and uh, we, we uh, actually perform quite well in both the uh, autologous environment as well as uh, allogeneic. Also, there's this centralized versus decentralized manufacturing uh, idea. So, you know, there's, there's never the perfect uh, platform, but, but we, uh, we're trying to hit the sweet spot as it relates to regardless of which, which direction uh, the system will have flexibility and will be innovative enough to be able to uh, adapt to those different uh, environments. So the, the question is, so what, you know? Well, so what, what does this all mean for, for quantum? And so uh, the next four slides get into facts and data um, ab about uh, performance. And this is a story of uh, the top graph, which is quantum, uh, and it's a story of continuous perfusion uh, versus batch feed. 
on the bottom with flask. And, um, you know, pictures, picture says a thousand words. Um, the important thing here is the control. And that's what automation uh, brings to a process. Now, could we tighten up? Could the process below be tightened up so that it isn't so jagged? And the answer is yes, of course it could. But, but will that be a continuous improvement in performance over time? And uh, that's where the, the, it's a trickier answer as to whether you can make that process as tight and as consistent as, as an automated system. The next three slides um, I, I uh, am going, about to introduce here are, I hope, you're, I hope you're properly caffeinated because there's, there's a lot on these slides. I apologize for that. I'm going to do my best to explain what, what they're all about. Dr. Mark McCall at Loughborough University um, uh, did an enterprise fellowship in regenerative medicine. And uh, it was a three-year thesis, and it was a systematic analysis of the cost of goods uh, looking across the industry. And so I was able to um, utilize three uh, slides from, from his presentation, and there's a lot of data behind this that I'm not going to, to bore you with, but later today, Mark McCall is actually going to be presenting, I believe, in here on an extenuation, extension, sorry, an extension of this, of the data, uh, some of which uh, I'm going to present today. But the next three slides divide this into manufacturing costs. This is looked at from a very industrial perspective. Uh, manufacturing costs, and then um, also cost of capital, and then finally a validation cost. So with that, I'll show you the first slide. So on the x-axis is just annual production capacity uh, for, for millions of cells uh, that, that are required. Um, on the y-axis is just a manufacturing cost. And as you would expect with the three uh, technologies that were looked at here, quantum's in blue and uh, hyperflasks in red, and stir tank uh, microcarrier, Suspension is, uh, is in the green, as you would expect. Of course, that, that starts out high, but gets uh, very, very efficient. Um, the reason you see this, this flattening out here and, and a slight uh, increase is that what has to enter the conversation as you begin to scale up is media, the cost of media, as, as, as well as harvest. And so this analysis um, it was broken down at a, at, a, at a very detailed level, and uh, that, that is why you see a slight increase here as you go out as opposed to a leveling uh, with, with, uh, with the quantum technology. Next is capital cost. So as you might expect, the, the, um, uh, intuitively, that these systems, uh, again, quantum's in blue and, and automated hyperflasks in red, um, as, as, you, as your demand for number of cells in, in hundreds of billions total here uh, go up, um, so does the cost of your capital. And um, uh, primarily on the hyperflasks because of the uh, space required as, as you scale up uh, and, the, and the needs, the space needs uh, increase. Um, the, um, the one thing I'll say about the model is that uh, it, models, it modeled out platforms, it's the same cost throughout the continuum as you went from left to right. And in, in, the, in the real world, what would happen is that as volumes increased and the need, at least in the case of quantum, the need for more systems would increase, that cost of capital would begin to decrease. So that curve actually would begin to, to reverse. Uh, and, and at some point, it becomes a zero cost because it can be spread out over the, over the cost of just sheer volume. Now, the, the third slide in, uh, in Dr. McCall's um, work here, um, I will uh, introduce it with uh, two, two levels, um, and we're going to go 3D here. Um, and the first one is cost of validation. And on the far right, you see the technologies with, with uh, 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 quantum on the bottom right and then the different technologies up, up on the right. And then what you see here is, is, is um, from a validation and being able to validate that technologies as, as, you, as you scale uh, are the same. 
if, if you have the same bioreactor and all you're doing is just adding systems, um, that the cost of validation can come down. Um, the second part of this is a little bit tougher to, to um, e explain. Let me do my best with this. So this is cost of validation and comparability activities. So what you see here are three sets of three graphs. And I'll start over here on the left. And what this is saying is when you perform an IQ, OQ, PQ, um, and you have added up those, those costs, this, that's essentially what you're looking at here with the validation costs in whatever color that is, uh, and then above it, green, is the comparability cost. And this is a risk, a regulatory risk profile, meaning that in this, in this bunch of uh, these three graphs, this is a best case for the facility in terms of cost, this is a likely case, and this is a worst case. So that's how this is uh, divided out. And then, um, again, it's a very industrial way to look at it, it's factory and then enabled clinic. But the difference between this set of three and this set of three is as the scale up begins and the new, and the new size, whether it's the size of the, of the stir tank or a number of sites that are being expanded, the regulatory burden to prove that it is the same as your initial runs in your initial sites starts to go up. And so in this scenario, it is saying that the, regula the regulators are going to say, show us that you are comparable in your new site to your original IQ, OQ, PQ. And that's, that's what you need to prove to us. And then in that risk profile, you've got a best case, likely, and worst case set of scenarios. And then as you get far to the right, this is where the regulator says, you have to now compare to every, uh, every example, every site, uh, and, and, and essentially uh, do a very involved study uh, at each of the sites from an IQ, OQ, PQ. And with that, you have a, a best case, uh, likely, and worst case. And so what this, what this shows is just the, the risk factor as scale up begins in a very quantitative uh, a, a analysis and just to, just to bring home what is going on and what the, what the uh, risks are in, in this area. So with, with that, um, let, let me bring it a little bit closer to home here for, for quantum and what is, what is the experience there. So this was, um, this was work done at Baylor College of Medicine and uh, Texas Children's. And, um, and this is MSCs uh, for the treatment of ischemic um, uh, stroke. And this uh, uh, was an IND that was filed and has been approved. Um, it's the flask process, you can see, I, I won't read it, uh, but four passages, 340 flasks, 30 days, and 250 million cells. And then they looked at doing the same process with quantum. And uh, it, was, it was a load, load unprocessed, they loaded it unprocessed directly from uh, bone marrow, two passages, two sets, about 20 days harvest uh, at 250 million cells. They went further, they, they went back and they looked at every detail of the process uh, from time through uh, release testing. And you can, uh, you can see some of the comparisons. Um, they even looked at um, you know, pipettes and how many pipette tips were used and, and did the analysis. And, and the bottom line is they came out, they came out pretty close because this is a, this is a single use uh, you know, quantum system fully fully burdened from a capital perspective, but there were some, uh, some, some pretty nice outcomes that they were, that they were uh, very, very happy with. And it just gives you some, uh, some idea in a real world uh, setting of what the, uh, what the comparison uh, can look like. And so um, for us, we're not standing still. Um, we, we know how important it is to keep innovating. Uh, we, we don't have the um, perfect platform uh, yet, probably far from it, uh, but we are improving. Last year, uh, a 2.0 software enhancement to help with the tracking. Uh, so from a, an F, you know, a regulatory 
guidance perspective, we're, we're tracking very closely as to what they're going to be looking for when we start to scale up with these systems. And uh, that, that software uh, enhancement has been uh, uh, very well received. We also have in, uh, in Denver, Colorado, an applications lab uh, with seven, seven scientists at work uh, uh, full time on optimizing the yields of the, of the bioreactor. And we saw last year alone a 40% increase in yield on the bioreactor. We, we found out through science that we were not getting, we were not utilizing all of that area inside of the bioreactor. And so, um, so we're doing a lot to optimize what we have, but we're also looking, uh, looking for the f to the future here as well. Back in 2012, uh, we were pretty narrowly defined um, in terms of capabilities and what we were going after, MSCs and fibroblasts. Uh, last year, we opened up uh, Asia Pacific as a geography, increased the number of cell types, uh, and then uh, this year, um, uh, as we, as we uh, get going in Asia Pacific, uh, Europe has, has been uh, rolling for us well for the last a couple of years, and uh, in the U.S. Is, is beginning to pick up, um, but Lat Latin America uh, will be added as, as well this year to, uh, to, you know, the geographies that we're going to be working with. And we, we virtually are working with uh, all of these indications uh, and, and lots of different um, cell therapy companies and university research uh, that's going on around the world. So um, with that, um, I, I started out by saying that there would be three key messages and um, um, they were that, um, you know, you have to have a long-term commitment um, to this and, um, you know, we are all in this together. Um, uh, you know, the, the company uh, certainly starting back in 1964 and utilizing uh, centrifugal science technology, which is one of our specialties, uh, helps, us, helps us in this arena, uh, but very much of a long-term perspective. Um, number two, innovation will change the game here. And facts and data are leading indicators. And I know it takes time. It takes time to prove that what, what these new technologies are doing can deliver long term and you can feel good about it and feel like you will place your bets in those areas uh, for, the, for the long term. And uh, finally, automation will drive the cost of goods down. Uh, our model is not unique. It's the proverbial razor, razor blade model where um, you know, eventually the, the razor is given away and you only buy the razor blades. It isn't that way today, but eventually as scale up begins to happen and, and you can distribute those costs uh, wider, um, this, this is what happens. And, and so cost of goods uh, will be driven down just by, just by definition. So, um, so with that, I thank you very much. Uh, and for the sake of time, we'll, we'll not take questions, I'm sure.